Now, tonight is very special because we get to hear from two renowned journalists and communicators on one of the most pressing issues of our time, how we care for Canada's seniors. Now, if you're attending this event, I'm going to assume that you care about this a lot and you've been following the news on how COVID has impacted seniors who live in long-term care facilities and the immense policy failures that this pandemic has exposed. Now, I don't know about you, but it's hard for me to read the news and not think that this is also a failure of compassion and how we as a society decide who deserves to live or die with dignity. Now, because this is a very emotional topic, I want you to all feel free to share how you're feeling in the chat as we begin. I think that when we're in these very impersonal and cold spaces like Zoom, it's especially important for us to read each other, read each other's feelings and feel connected. So please feel free to do that in the chat whenever. Now, I'm gonna introduce both of the speakers tonight. So I'm gonna ask Andre and Catherine to join me on the stage. Hello, nice to see you. Andre Picard is a health reporter for the Globe and Mail. Uh, he is the author of five best-selling books and an eight-time nominee for the National Newspaper Awards. And he's also a winner of the Missioner Award for Meritorious Public Service Journalism, which, as many of you know, is the most prestigious award in journalism in Canada. He also received the Queen Elizabeth II Diamond Jubilee Medal for his dedication to improving healthcare. And to guide the conversation today, we have Catherine Gretzinger, who is an associate professor at UBC School of Journalism and an award-winning public broadcaster with the CBC. Now, in 2018, she was named as one of North America's top innovative journalism educators. And Catherine is also a key member of the Global Reporting Center. So what we're going to do now is they're going to talk for about 30 to 40 minutes, and then we'll open it up to questions from the audience. So as you're listening to this conversation, if you think of a great question, please share it in the Q&A feature. So there's a little Q&A button there. Uh, and then well, they'll be able to get to it afterwards. So enough from me. Without further ado, Catherine, please take it away. Thank you, Jorge. What a beautiful introduction. It's, um, it's so wonderful to be um, welcomed in such a personal and authentic way. So thank you very much for, uh, for welcoming us and, and everyone to this evening. Um, it's a real delight to be here to moderate these questions and comments to the star of the show, uh, Andre Picard, who is someone I've become so fond of in the, the last few months. I've always been a huge fan of his journalism and the incredible public service work that he's done, but he's been in the classroom with us since January as a visiting professor at UBC. So it's the virtual classroom, of course, but we have been able to see one another from time to time. But his wisdom and his intention and his commitment to telling important stories in the public interest is inspiring. And so it's really wonderful to be invited here tonight. So Andre, I am welcome to another Zoom encounter. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're, we're getting used to this, are we not? Yes. <laughs> so thank you so much for um, doing this event for the Vancouver Public Library, which is an institution that's very near and dear to my heart. Um, welcome to so many of you from across the country who are joining us this evening. And I want to just begin with a great big wide open question that I would never ask you on the air because it would take you too long. Um, but I do want to sort of put it to you. If you could bring us sort of up to date with what's going on right now with the pandemic. There's been so much change, even in the last week or so, with the variants, with vaccines, with the numbers. If you were to sort of put it into frame for those of us participating this evening, how would you do that? Yeah, so I think, you know, we're at the beginning of a, a third wave that's looking like it's going to be worse than the previous two. So it's a it's a pretty depressing time, to be honest. It's really hard on our morale at this point. Uh, you know, those of us who have been following this for 15 months, the public has been, everybody suffered to varying degrees from this. And it's just really hard to recognize that it's a long way from over. So we have this new challenge of variants that spread more quickly. They seem to be uh, really harming younger people. Uh, you know, the, the, what the pandemic is turning out to be now, it's hitting young people and hitting them really hard. People are spending way longer in the intensive care, et cetera. So it's getting quite dramatic for people who are normally young and healthy. And uh, just, uh, it's sort of, it's a new pandemic. Uh, the, the variants have taken over from, uh, we call it jokingly in our newsroom, uh, coronavirus classic has sort of disappeared and these new worst variants have come along. So it's a, it's a really challenging time. 
but in against a backdrop of real hope from vaccines. Uh, we've had 10 million vaccines delivered in Canada, six and a half million put into people, but we have a long way to go. And it's this race between the vaccines and the variants. And uh, right now the variants are winning, unfortunately. What is this current status of, of vaccines? Um, I know that there's been sort of a constant flow of them coming into the country, but what seems to be the holdup in getting them into people's arms quickly? Yeah, so for the longest time, our problem in Canada was supply. You know, the our contracts were very backloaded, so that we're going to get a lot of vaccine come the summer, but very little at the outset. The whole world wants these vaccines, so not everybody can have them, unfortunately. Uh, the problem with getting into the arms is, is a lot less clear. There seems to be a bit of disorganization. There seems to be a, a little bit of Canadianism there where we're so worried about getting them to the right people that we're not getting them to anyone. So we're sort of being so cautious that it's, it's harming us. Uh, you know, if you compare us to the US, the US rollout is not perfect. There's a lot of inequities there, but they're just letting it rip. They're just like getting 3 million people vaccinated a day. And that's sort of what we have to do at this point is just start just getting vaccines into people 24 hours a day. Is there any indication that any province is prepared to do the 24-7 cycle? We, we've seen initiatives in BC and Ontario and elsewhere where people are being retrained from tourism jobs, for example, to, to being, is, is there, are there those, those initiatives being ramped up at all at this point? Yeah, they're being ramped up, not, not quickly enough, but I think we're really going to see, you know, in a normal year, we can do a million vaccines a week. That's what we do during flu season. And why we're not doing that now, it's just kind of boggles the mind that we're not doing what we can do ordinarily when we should be doing two or three times that level. So we have the capacity, but there's a real lack of disorganization. There's a real lack of uh, thoughtfulness in it. You know, you see these pictures every day of empty clinics and it's so, so maddening, you know, but then you, why are you having a clinic for 75 year olds at 6 p.m. in downtown Toronto? Of course, no one is there. Have a clinic at seven o'clock in the morning when 75 year olds are up. Like it's just very, it's just sensible things are not being done uh, and it's very, very frustrating. Thank you very much for um, bringing us up to date on the vaccine. The reason why we're here this evening is that Andre has put out yet another um, best-selling book, as Jorge mentioned. It's number five. It's called Neglected No More, The Urgent Need to Improve the Lives of Canada's Elders in the Wake of a Pandemic. And it reads like a real story. It, you take us into um, lives of people. You introduce us to a number of different people along the way. Um, as you turned your attention to something that you've been watching for a very long time. What was the most surprising to you um, in all the things that you discovered? Uh, I think what was surprising is not being surprised, you know, that all this, what happened during uh, COVID was really sadly predictable. You know, I, as you said, I've been covering these issues for 30 some years. I lived this with my, with my parents 20 years ago. And just the, the inertia is just so frustrating to realize nothing has really changed in decades. Uh, things have just degraded, uh, but the same issues we do report after report. I, I write in the book that we've done 150 inquiries and reports about how to fix this system and we just never fix it. We just uh, do little touch-ups and we never really do the fundamental changes that are required. So it's, it's frustrating, but to me this, the, you know, doing the book now is just this opportunity to, you know, when people were forced to pay attention to something we don't like to pay attention to, which is getting old and, and dying, uh, but we were forced to by the pandemic. So this is the opportunity to just say, listen, here's what we have to do next. How did we ever come to a point in Canada where we sort of started to warehouse elderly people? where we sort of lost the plot of being together from birth to death and started to move people out of homes and into facilities rather than keeping them in family units. You know, I'm a, I think a lot of it is historical, it's cultural. I'm a huge fan of, I read lots of medical history because I think it explains a lot of our current problems. Every issue in Canadian healthcare today can be explained by uh, historical errors and quirks in our system. So I, I always fixate on that. And the history of elder care is really fascinating. It, it has nothing to do with the health system. It came out up through the penal system, through the jail system. So it goes back to the history of our, what we have today, goes back to the Elizabethan poor laws of 1601, where it was really the first time they had any social programs, this notion that you have to take care of the poor. 
uh, just not leave them. But the attitude, the, the fundamental philosophy of those laws is that people, nobody should get handouts. So even if you're poor, you got to work for your, your meager ration, essentially for your gruel, you have to do a hard day's work. And that's how these homes came to be. They were called workhouses and poor houses and all kinds of different names. Uh, many of which we would not use those words anymore. But essentially, if your family couldn't take care of you, you ended up in these homes working day and night for very slim rations. Uh, until, in the 19, until the 1960s in Canada, there were still homes where people wore uniforms, worked for their, worked for their, take, their keep, et cetera. People don't believe that. Like in my lifetime, this, this still occurred. And that the revolution sort of came in, in the 1960s, but uh, it wasn't the best revolution. Right. You write that um, it's almost as if the treatment of elders has come close to full circle over the past century and a half. The paupers, Canadians with no pension and no savings, aren't subjected to forced labor anymore, but they get only the bare minimum, such as a spot in a four-day, four-bed ward room and a couple of hours of hands-on duty care. That sort of relegation to second-class status was supposed to have ended with Medicare and its grand principle that no one would be denied care because because of inability to pay. But Medicare paradoxically created two classes of care, hospitals and doctors funded universally and everything else funded largely through private payment. Yes. How, did, how did that break happen in our, in our, in our communal psyche that we, we made it okay to fund hospital or institutional type care that looks like doctors and nurses and we cut off other kinds of private care where people went to live their final days of their lives. Yeah, it's one of those things that didn't happen deliberately. It happened sort of by omission. So we had this great notion, Medicare in the 1950s, you know, no one should be denied care because they can't afford it. And we implemented it with hospitals. We implemented it in, with a little more difficulty with doctors because doctors didn't like it. And then we stopped. And our Medicare system is really frozen in time. It's frozen in this 1960s view that Healthcare consists solely of doctors and hospitals. Other countries have evolved. So other countries, you know, there are many countries with universal healthcare. And I always say Canada has the least universal universal healthcare system. Uh, we make this assumption that the Medicare system is going to take care of us into our old age, but it's not true. Uh, once you don't need acute care, uh, once you don't need to be in hospital for surgery or need to be to your doctor to get a, you know, your heart pills, you fall off a cliff. You have to pay a lot of money and the wealthy get much, much better care. Uh, to me, it really offends the whole principle of Medicare, the way we treat things other than doctors and physicians. And it's not unique to long-term care, it applies to home care, it applies to, to pharma, you know, to drugs, to physio, all kinds of things are left out. Uh, people uh, can't afford hearing aids. That's a really essential thing, you know, for your, your health, but they can be just way too expensive. So all these things that are forgotten that other countries cover much better than we do. You write a, a remedy for this in chapter 12, which we'll get to in a couple of minutes. But um, one of the things that you write about is that healthcare is a people business, that trained workers provided skilled care to patients in need. Yet Canada does not have a health human resources strategy. How can that be? That there's not a, a strategy to ensure that the humans who lay their hands upon other humans to provide care is not a strategic plan that's monitored or measured by Health Canada. Yeah, it does. It does boggle the mind. You know, if you think of this uh, in sort of a business sense, uh, med healthcare is a business. It's one of the biggest businesses in Canada. It's about two hundred and sixty billion dollars a year, so a quarter of a trillion dollars, and there's no personnel plan. You can't imagine any corporation operating like this, right? So just an example, uh, we have way more pediatricians than geriatricians, but we have a very quickly aging society. It makes no sense. So you ask the, the groups that decide on these things, why? Well, because of history. It's always been that way. That's how we do things. So there's no thought put into it. There's no recognition of you know, we, we uh, negotiate contracts for doctors and nurses as if the other professions don't exist. We do all these things in isolation. So there's no, no rhyme or reason to the number of people we have working. So to me, it's all about, you know, getting the right care at the right place at the right time. And you can't do that if you don't have a, a thought out personnel plan or a human resources plan. 
there's no excuse for for people not knowing because as you suggest there have been so many studies and reports and there's so much information flowing and yet the gaps continue um, do you think that this pandemic now that it surfaced some of the realities that people are finding really difficult um, do you think now is the moment that things could possibly change well, I think it's the moment some things have to change. So I think we have to pick our battles, right? So I don't think we can fix everything. That's often a problem in Canada as we get into this what aboutism, you start to do something and what about these 10 other things? And then we end up doing none of the 11. So I'm a proponent of, I think the time is ripe politically, uh, culturally, uh, to do elder care, to fix this part, and then we can fix drugs later, et cetera. And I think once we make a big change, it'll be easier to do those other things in a, in a domino manner. But I think, you know, uh, we've had about 23,000 COVID deaths in Canada, 16,750 of those have occurred in these long-term care institutions. So it's just the, the, the breadth of the carnage is hard to, to express in words. But I, you know, if we don't act based on that, I, I don't think we'll ever fix this if this doesn't bring us to fix the system. Well, it was it was so shocking when that report came out of Ontario um, that uh, the military went in and did that that report in page after page after page. You would think that the the efforts of the province would have tilted at that moment, um, reckoning with the truth of that report, and yet we don't talk about that report anymore. There's small measures that are being done. People are doing pilot projects, 30 beds here, 45 there. Um, it's almost like there's a, an intellectual dissonance. And, and I, is it money in the end or is it in intention? What, what, what is responsible for that? I think I don't think money is an issue. I think money is a fear. So we're fearful that this will cost. So, so there's two main excuses. This will cost too much and it's too complicated. And neither of those things is true. Uh, we spend a lot of money now on bad care. We spend maybe $10 billion on long-term care, another five, six, seven billion on home care, and it's just not spent efficiently. So we have a lot of money there. Uh, we do have to spend a bit more money because we've neglected the sector for, for decades. So there's no question we need a little more, but it's not a lot of money in the grand scheme of things that's needed. That shouldn't be an impediment. And then the other one is, oh, there's too much to do. And I, I don't think that's true because there are many other countries who do it. It's doable, uh, it's affordable, and it's essential. So I, I, I just think we have to stop making excuses. Uh, you talked about the army report. Well, what was the, the upshot of that was essentially appointing another inquiry. So there's a, a long-term care inquiry going on in Ontario now. And I write in the book, we, we don't need more inquiries. We need action. So to me, uh, the single biggest thing politicians have to do is stop appointing inquiries and they have to start appointing expert committees to say, do this. Uh, so I'll give you an example, uh, bring in standards of care in long-term care homes, uh, four hours a day. That's sort of the, what's recognized in academia is what's needed, four hours a day of hands-on care per person. And if I was the government, I would say, tell me how to do that how many people do I need? How much money will it cost? And I commit up front to do it. So you give me the, the structural uh, solution and I'll give you the money and I'll give you the willpower. And that we could change things overnight if we had that approach. One of, one of the, the lines that you write in the, in the book that really jumped out at me is currently about 80% of shifts in care homes and home care are not fully staffed, which creates an untenable situation. We, we've, we've heard in the last several weeks that people who work in these facilities are tending to have to work 50 hours a week just to make minimum wage to be able to sort of pay their 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 way. And yet they're they're not able to fully staff these facilities. So why not a mass hiring plan to just to manage that piece alone and make sure that there's enough people in the facilities to provide this, this care. That might be a quick fix uh, that could help people from tourism who haven't got work at the moment. Yeah, absolutely. So I think a mass hiring is needed, but uh, you have to recognize that people aren't gonna take these jobs if they're not better. So we have to fix the work environment. It's not just about money. Uh, BC, uh, you know, caregivers, even personal support workers are well paid in BC. Uh, where most workers are unionized is about $26 an hour. But in places like Quebec, uh, they get as little as $13 an hour. So we have to have some equity there. 
uh, but it's not just about money. It's about giving people uh, some power. So a lot of these jobs are just like, they're almost like factory jobs now. You have to change X number of continents pads per hour and you have to feed this many meals and you don't interact with people. And that's not why people go into these, these professions. It's because they care about people. It's not because they care about tasks. So we have to change the work environment fundamentally to, to make these jobs attractive. You know, Quebec did the right thing. Quebec announced a hiring spree. They announced they, they hired 10,000 personal support workers, but uh, six months later, they only have 5,000 uh, who survived the training because it's not easy work. And then in a year, they'll probably lose at least half of those again, because if you don't stay a year, you have to pay back the tuition. So there's an incentive to stay, but there's a real fear that they'll lose they'll end up with no more workers in the end. So it is a big, big challenge, but yeah, it, it is essential because care, you know, as you read from the book, it's, it's a people business, but people caring for people and without the adequate staffing, everything else goes out the window. Right. One of the things that you also write about is that this is skilled work. Uh, people tend to think that because um, some of the staffers are lower paid or they might um, they might not present in ways that sort of um, people would look at as, as as skilled as a doctor or a nurse, they have their own uh, vast sets of skills that they bring to caring for elderly people. Is it almost like a, a psychological shift that we need to do in the way that we think about these people who provide care? Yeah, it's a psychological shift. We have to be stop being so patronizing. We have to realize, you know, I, I won't use the words uh, low skilled worker. It's not low skilled, it's low paid. Uh, and it's disrespected work more than anything else. But, you know, if anyone, uh, you know, I've had two parents with uh, dementia. If anyone has ever tried to feed someone with dementia, has tried to change them, they'll realize in about a nanosecond that this is really skilled work. It's really, really difficult or to bathe someone who doesn't want to be bathed. These are very, very difficult tasks. We would love to hear from those people who are joining us this evening. If you would like to uh, put a question in the Q&A, um, participate in the chat, you're welcome to do so. And we'll try to get through as many of your questions as possible uh, over the course of the next half hour or so. So Alex McPherson writes, how do you propose that the elder care you envision is funded at a Canadian wide level? Well, you know, I think we have uh, that we have the system that we have. We can't have a discussion about healthcare in Canada without talking about the constitution. But I often say, I, I want that argument off the table. So yes, healthcare is a provincial responsibility, not, not uniquely, but generally, but there's no constitutional impediment to cooperation and to common sense. So those are the things we need. I, I don't wanna hear any of these excuses about the constitution. There's no impediment whatsoever to do it. We do all kinds of things nationally. They don't have to be federal programs, but they can be national, which means some semblance of, of equity between provinces. So let, let's stop using hiding behind that excuse and just, uh, you know, I'm a big fan of lock the 13 ministers of health in a room and <laughs> don't let them out until they have an agreement. And I, I don't think it should take that long. It's everybody wants the best care for their grandfather and their grandmother and their parents and that's what we should want for everyone it's not a very difficult philosophical discussion to have right thank you very much for the question alex elena writes my grandmother passed away in a home in ottawa the most compassionate staff ever we need more compassion and we need to change the system now wise words andre well first i'm really sorry for her loss it's a one that many, many families uh, suffered across Canada, unfortunately, tens of thousands. Uh, and I, I'm glad she talked about the staff because most of the staff are so, so dedicated. Uh, when I was doing the book, I talked to so many nurses and uh, public uh, personal support workers. And, you know, they didn't complain about their wages. They didn't complain about their hours. They didn't be, complain about their lives being put at risk. They complained that they didn't have the time to care for people. You know, that's the reality. People who are in these jobs, the, the lifers, which is, uh, you know, the core people who do this, they, they're really caring people and we have to give them the ability to care. And that's one of the big things we lack in, in Canadian healthcare is just giving people the power and the time and the, the, the resources to care properly because right? they're, they're tremendously skilled and we have to give them that. So uh, that recognition is really important. Uh, I'm glad she brought it up. 
Elena, thank you very much for bringing that up. Trish, actually, um, you, you, it was like you were waiting to sort of ask the follow-up question. Thank you for this one. Staffing will help, but if the model of care stays the same, the culture that drives the care with change, and this leads to the change in the conditions of care. The fact that aging is not a disease should drive the changes needed. The social care model is what is used in Denmark, who've been caring for people in their homes as they age for the past 30 years or so. So why reinvent or try to fill positions while we keep the same model of care under the current system? Interesting point, Trish, thank you. Yeah, very important point in the book. I have a whole chapter about Denmark sort of being the, the gold standard for care around the world. And the very simple explanation is the one that, that Trish gave. It's about people first. It's like, what do people need? What do they want? And then we that's the starting point of care. It's not, in Canada, you often sort of get, here's what you're allocated, X number of hours. Uh, you're going to get your bath on Tuesday, whether you want a bath or whether you want it on Tuesday, too bad. This is how. So it is a, a factory model. So she's quite right. We need that person-centered. And paradoxically, you know, the countries that have really good care have very few rules because they don't need them. If you give, if you empower workers, if they understand what they have to do, you don't need a whole bunch of rules. A long-term care facility in Canada will often have a hundred pages of regulations of things they have to do. And not one of those regulations talks about care, about the quality of care, about the happiness of uh, people living there. They're all about, you know, is the butter at the right temperature so they don't get food poisoning? Stuff that you shouldn't have to write down, but you have to write it down because uh, the money is so short and because the, the, the rules are so tight that people have no freedom. Uh, you know, Pat Armstrong, a sociologist who's sort of the guru in this field, has a great expression. She says, the conditions of work are the conditions of care. And I, I sort of embrace that philosophy in the book that it has to start with the workers. If the workers aren't empowered, if the workers don't have the resources, if they're not treated well, we will never deliver good care. So again, uh, she pointed out to Denmark, we heard about Norway, Finland. It's because they have good labor practices that they have good care. Right. Thank you for that uh, response. Rustem writes, uh, thank you very much, Andre. This question, what kind of private sector innovations are you seeing in this sector? Um, because we did talk earlier about how there are some really good options in Canada, but they do tend to be in the private sector. So what are you seeing in terms of innovation? Yeah, so the innovations are often this uh, sort of a variation on what we talked about Denmark. It's all about putting the person first. So there's all kinds of different, there's dementia village, there's a, uh, I'm trying to, they're all sort of these uh, copyrighted names. I'm trying to think of Eden, et cetera. So, but they all are essentially the same philosophy is uh, when people are in a home, make it like a house, make it like a home. Don't make it like a prison. Like a lot of our facilities, you know, a lot of them provide good care, but they're ugly places and they're not built for people in wheelchairs. They don't have, you know, wide corridors. I remember visiting a, a home many years ago and I, I learned this word called horridor, which is what they call those narrow hallways that people dread when they go into institutions, right? They just sort of, it looks like a horror movie and they, they barely fit a wheelchair. You can't turn around your wheelchair. So it's, they call them horridors. So we have to build uh, facilities purposefully. We have to build them. We have to remember that these are people's homes and we don't treat them like homes. So they're uh, too often our long-term care facilities are hospitals without hospital care. They're the worst of both worlds. So we have to figure out, you know, make uh, homes like houses. And that, that's what all the good models do. And unfortunately, most of them cost a lot of money in Canada, $7,000, $15,000 a month for this type of, of good care, unfortunately. Well, when you look at the, the amount of um, resources being spent in building hospitals and um, building up this sort of technological side of, of healthcare, so much money goes to that uh, side of the ledger. And yet Canadians in study after study after study are asking for more of what you're describing. They want to live and die at home. They want to have personal support workers. They want to be as free to make their own decisions for their health and well-being as, as possible. So how do we um, sort of move back to this more um, simple model of just saying, let's provide a place of comfort for, for people as they age so that they can, in a respectful way, um, make their way out of this life pleasantly. How do we just turn the dial somewhat for that? 
Yeah, I think it's a it's a cultural shift that we need. We have to recognize that there are limits to, you know, I, I say we don't have a healthcare system in Canada. We have a sickness care system. So we have to get away from just providing sickness care, especially to people who don't want it or need it, to be honest. You know, I get to, I have the, the privilege of talking to a lot of older people uh, in the end, their final years of life, and they, they don't want the 15 operations. They want to spend the last two months of their life with their grandchildren, you know, with not in pain. They don't want to go through all this stuff that's going to prolong their their number of days on earth by a few days, but their quality of life is gonna go downhill. So I think it's, we have to be more demanding about quality of life rather than quantity of life. And that's, that's a shift that won't happen easily. There's a lot of uh, vested interests in the system. Uh, no, you know, it's hard to make that decision to say, no, I wanna stop my cancer care. Uh, I know I have three months to live, but I, I wanna take advantage of those three months and not be sick throwing up every day. So these are tough decisions individually, and they're even more tough uh, structurally and systemically. But we have to change our, our attitudes about death and dying. And I think a lot of it, a lot of these changes, I think, have to start at our kitchen table. We just have to talk about this stuff much more openly. Uh, the people, the families I talked to in the book, the one, I, you know, I deliberately didn't choose the worst case scenarios. I kind of Choose, chose stories of families that did okay, you know, it's still hard, but they, they got out of it well. And what they all had in common is they talked about stuff. They talked about what are we going to do uh, if you get dementia? You know, the, the time to have those discussions is not in a time of crisis when the person doesn't recognize you anymore. It's when they're fully conscious and you, they can think things through. How much care do you want? Do you, you know, do you want a DNR? Do you want a do not resuscitate order? When do you want it? Where do you want to live? Yeah, those tough questions, if you have answers to them, it makes it so much easier to care for your loved ones. And again, I know this professionally, I know it personally, that it makes a huge difference to, to have those questions answered. You write in the book, Alex McPherson is just writing this into the uh, into the chat. In your book, you write that you don't think the Denmark model for elder care could work in Canada, um, even though that is sort of a gold standard model. How come? Well, I don't say it should, can't work. Uh, what I say is we have to be careful to not think we can import things whole hog, that we have to recognize our cultural and political systems are very different. So I think, you know, the, there's a very different philosophy of life in Denmark. We have to recognize that. So I'm not a big fan of let's import things. Uh, I'm in, in favor of importing ideas and adapting them to us. So I, I don't think we could be Denmark overnight, but I think we could be uh, a lot closer to Denmark uh, in, in a few years, uh, put it that way. So, so I hope you didn't get the impression that I didn't think it couldn't work here. It can work, but it's just going to be a difficult change. Right. And it's you know, they started a... doing this, they started doing it when it was easy before the, you know, they recognized in the 70s, early 80s, our society is going to get older. And then they started planning then. Uh, that's when we should have changed. It's a lot harder to do it now because we have so much catching up to do. Thanks for that uh, follow-up question, Alex. Uh, Shiraz writes, what percentage of care homes are privately corporate owned and what is the staff to elderly ratio in these care homes? Yeah, so it depends. Unfortunately, in Canada, it depends by province. So a province like Ontario, it's almost two thirds that are private. Uh, in Quebec, it's a very small number. It's only about 10%. Uh, BC off the top of my head, I think it's like a third are private. So it's a smaller number. So it really varies. Uh, I get a lot of questions about this, about private care. And my big worry, you know, I, I always say, you know, people, it always comes down, should we have private for-profit homes, right? So I think my worry is that this will be trotted out as a simplistic solution to a very complex problem. So I always answer that question, do we, should we have for-profit? I answer it in two ways. One is we absolutely don't need them. There are countries that have great private in, uh, care without any for-profit facilities. So we don't need them but we have them. So the question is, why do we have them and what do we do about it? And the reason we have them is because governments don't like to invest in infrastructure. They don't like to have debt and they don't like to have debt because the public doesn't tolerate them having debt. So they're there for a reason. So we, I think we have to sort of hold our nose and, and recognize they're there. We have to regulate them better. Uh, we have to make sure the system improves overall. You know, a lot of people say, oh, there were a lot more deaths in private homes uh, during COVID, which is true, but it's mostly because they're older, they have more four bedrooms, et cetera. Uh, Quebec has virtually no private care. It had the highest death rate. So it's not a panacea. 
So I think I, I really worry that, uh, you know, I think ownership matters, but it's about 25 on number 25 on my list of to, my to do list. So I think let's talk about it, but uh, it, to me, it is not going to make a difference overnight. We can fix a lot of things and still have uh, for profit care homes there, maybe phase them out. But uh, a very, it's, it's a very complex issue, the, the, the ownership model. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Tony writes I'm a caregiver for my dad who has Alzheimer's. What are your thoughts on a caregiver allowance or basic income allowing us to earn? a part-time or some wages and the allowance to supplement it. I can't help but feel that this would save the province's money. Yeah, there's no question that we have to do more for caregivers. It's National Caregivers Day today, I should mention that. So uh, congratulations, Tony. And you know, it's about 7.8 million Canadians who, who care for a loved one to some degree. 10% uh, of them, 780,000, essentially do it full-time. Commit more than 40 hours a week to the care of a spouse or a, sometimes a child or a grandparent. So, and most of them, you know, we have to say, vast majority women, most of them women who also have paying jobs, who have children. This is a tremendous burden on women and on caregivers overall. So, what should we do? Uh, yeah, I think we should have sort of an EI type program. You know, uh, in, you can get uh, an allowance while you're off caring for a loved one. Canada does have programs, but they're not well structured. So you can get an EI type leave, but you have to prove that your loved one is gonna die within X number of weeks. So kind of a ridiculous thing. Uh, that's, you know, that's not how people with uh, Alzheimer's go. They sort of go up and down, up and down. You're not sure exactly when they're going to die. So the, the programs have to be better structured. They have to be more realistic. I think we have to do all kinds of little things for caregivers that, because they, they, I think we have to remember caregivers do this, uh, almost all of them, almost universally, willingly, lovingly, uh, you know, passionately, they do this, but we have to give them a break. We have to stop burning them out, taking advantage of them. So respite is really important, just getting a break. Uh, and the respite has to be easy. I was, one of the things I was surprised with talking to caregivers in the book is very few of them took advantage of the respite care that exists because it was too complicated. You know, by the time they got the person all packed up and moved, they were so exhausted that they uh, barely rested by the time they were coming back after a week. So we have to figure out how to do this better. But yeah, there's all kinds of little things we have to do for caregivers to bail them out. And uh, uh, a support program, as he mentioned, is just one example. And some provinces do do it uh, better than others, but uh, we have to improve that dramatically, for sure. Thank you. Kim writes, this is a critical discussion. My fear is that the conversation will peter out as COVID issues get resolved and will return to complacency. I know this is one of your fears too, Andre. Um, it's a cultural issue of not valuing our elders. We hide them away. We don't appreciate what they contribute or respect them for who they are and what matters to them. Extending empty lives is repugnant. Amen to that. So I think, yeah, I think she's really hit the nail on the head that I think, and I say this in the book, the number one change we need is a philosophical one. We have to say, and this is the difference between us and Denmark. Denmark said in the 1980s, we value our elders. We want them to live in the community as long as humanly possible. And then once you have that philosophy, everything else is actually pretty easy, right? It's just technical implementation of what you believe in. So to me, once we, I think we have to articulate, I think a lot of people believe that individually and we have to express that we believe it collectively as well. Nobody so a refer wants referendum? Or, or I, yeah, I'm not big on referendum. A Canadian way, way to go about, but some way to allow Canadians to express. Yeah. Yeah, having lived in Quebec for a long time, I'm not a big fan of referendums, but, uh, oh. <laughs> but uh, I, you know, I think we have to just, uh, collectively do we have to talk about this incessantly uh, mm -hmm. bother our politicians i used to much earlier in my career be much more critical of politicians over the years i've realized they'll essentially they lead from behind right so they'll do whatever they think the public will tolerate and i think the reason the system has not changed is the feeling that the public is ambivalent and I, I think we have to change that attitude so we have to have, make in our individual collective voices heard across the country. Uh, to me, one of the most uplifting things has not been an, a lot uplifting during COVID, but one of the most uplifting things is I've, I've done many chats like this and 
I found that's what's really given me hope is so many young people participate. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I did this, uh, a clubhouse, so, you know, a, a hipster link. So I did a chat there, I was invited on clubhouse and there were hundreds of young people just saying, I'm sickened as this, uh, our question just said, I'm sickened by the way my grandmother's treated. This has to change, what can I do? Uh, if we start getting this expressed across the generations, you know, not just older people yelling into the void, uh, you know, give me more care. If the young people start saying it, that, that's when things are really going to change and change quickly. So I think we have the power to do this. We have the money to do it. Well, we just have to, to keep the pressure on. Caitlin writes, I think perhaps the lack of value in elder care is the same as the lack of value in infant care. In other words, the EI model, yes, it's better than the US, but it is much worse than socially mature countries. Can you please comment on the country's culture of care? Yeah, so I, I think it's true. We, we don't do great on childcare either, uh, but I think it's a whole, I think there's a whole other level of neglect with elders, to be honest. Uh, if what happened in long-term care facilities happened in daycares in Canada, people would have been on parliament with pitchforks, let's be honest. You know, if we were letting babies die, and saying, oh, there's nothing we can do, there's no PPE, people wouldn't stand for that. So there is that ageism is, is baked in there pretty deep. So I, I think, yeah, childcare is an important discussion. There are very many similarities, and I don't say that to infantilize the elders, but there are many similarities in the needs and the, especially for caregivers. So there are things to be learned there, but I, I think they are very different issues in, in the end. Andre, you, in your writing, there's uh, such clarity um, and purpose behind it. Choosing the words neglected no more. Where did that title come from and why did you decide to be so blunt in your assessment when you um, chose the title for the book? Well, I think when we talk about this, we do have to be blunt. And I, I don't think there's, I think neglected is a really good word for it. You know, I, I think that there's no better word. Uh, it's interesting, I forget, uh, the, the French title is different. The French title is uh, oublié, so it's forgotten, but that was more of a play on, on Quebec's uh, motto, which is je me souviens, I always remember. So it was a little bit of wordplay there, so people often ask why is the French title different and that, that's the reason. But I, I do think you have to be blunt. And one of the things I did when I was uh, starting the book is I just started asking everybody I knew you know, how do you want to live out your final days, right? And I've done a couple of talk shows on this and the, the answers from people are very telling. I can predict with 100% certainty the three words that'll come up all the time. I want autonomy, I want respect, and I want dignity. That's, that's all we, everybody wants. People don't ask for the moon. They ask for simple things. Treat me with dignity. And our system doesn't do that. It, it's undignified the way we treat many elders, especially in institutions, but in home care as well, in our lack of social housing, of supportive housing, of community programs. You know, community groups do a lot of yeoman's work in this field. They do a lot of work for very little money. Their budgets have been frozen for decades, and they do 10 times as much work with the same money they had in, in the 80s. Uh, so there's a lot of stuff a lot of care is done uh, despite the system, not because of the system. Right. Um, the book winds up with a, a call to arms at the end, which I will have you read um, as we wind up in a few minutes. But please keep the questions coming. Some really uh, thoughtful and wonderful commentary uh, making its way into the Q&A and the chat. And we very much thank you for that. We're not going to get to all of your questions. Um, I want to be transparent about that, but we're going to do our best to provide as wide a range of uh, some of the themes and uh, questions that you have brought to bear. So I thank all of you for participating so fully. Trish writes, home care is inefficient. It's inconsistent across Canada and are swamped with managers and directors and a few overworked workers. There are better models to provide efficient care in homes of those who need um, using a Burtzog neighborhood care, save the Netherlands government $4 billion in the first year and $2 billion every year thereafter. Let's try this model and see what happens. I think that long-term care facilities, as we know, could be repurposed for the homeless, for example. Interesting thought. Andre, what do you think? Yeah, so the Burtzog model is an excellent model, a Dutch model, a nursing run, and it is very efficient. Uh, could it work in Canada? Yes, I think it could work, especially in our urban communities. 
uh, because you know it's sort of nurses traveling around on bicycles, being responsible for a neighborhood, etc. So it is a very good model, but again, you know, it's culturally we have to adapt it to Canada, right? It's just I always hesitate to bring these things in per exactly. So the philosophy, yes, we can do it. Uh, and she's quite right that uh, home care is very inefficient. I don't think it's inefficient to provide home care, but it's inefficiently run in Canada. Uh, about one third of our home care dollars are spent on administration. So it's very, very bureaucratic. We spent, we literally spend billions of dollars figuring out how to deny people care. So we, we've got to work on that. The other problem with home care in Canada is that it's fundamentally an extension of hospital. It's used principally to get people out of hospital beds quicker, send them home, get to short term care. And what we need is a model of home care that also provides chronic care. So it keeps people in the community. And again, it's about philosophy. You know, in countries like Denmark, Sweden, Norway, that's what they do really well is they, they spend about 80% of their elder care budgets on home and less than 20% on institutional care. And we're the opposite. We actually spend 80% of our do dollars on elder care on institutionalizing people. I, I call it in the book, our, I call our practice elder apartheid. We essentially take people and we remove them from, uh, this, from the community and we sent them off to these facilities where they essentially are stripped of their citizenship. That's why it's apartheid, right? They have no say, they don't have any choice in how they live, et cetera. That's our default mechanism and it shouldn't be. Our default mechanism should be we do everything to keep people in their homes, however we define their home. And it can be your, your family home, you're no longer able to be there, maybe you're in an apartment, maybe a retirement a facility, maybe a supportive housing. There's all kinds of ways to do this. And we need that full continuum, not leap, make this terrible leap right into a, an institution that people don't want to be in most of the time. Right. That um, that line that you wrote really resonated for me and it, it, it got us to having that conversation we had the other week around uh, the fact that there's been so much coverage of long term care. And we've heard from so few people who live in long term care when we know that a majority of people who are in care are there for physical ailments, not intellectual incapacity or things like that. We're not talking to people. So we've literally removed them from society and we've taken away their voices as well. So this whole question around values is really on all of us. The people in journalism as well to sort of go and seek out these folks and make sure that they're heard in the conversation. How do we break that barrier now that we've gone so far into this sort of pushing out? How do we kind of open the doors to just invite people back into the conversation? Yeah, I think we have a, a role to play with that as journalists. You know, it's hard during COVID. We were literally locked out. You just couldn't get to people. Uh, these, these are challenging. It's, it's hard to talk to people with dementia. It takes time. It takes effort. Uh, you know, things that we don't have in journalism anymore as newsrooms get cut. But again, it's about what do we prior, prioritize? Uh, what do we value? And we have to, I think, make more effort. I think, like everyone in society, journalists have stereotypes about older people, you know, they don't know stuff, they're too hard of hearing, etc. You know, the vast majority of elders uh, live in the community, they're active, uh, they want to talk to people, they want to be engaged, and we, we isolate them with our, our stereotyping. You know, even in Canada, the majority of 100-year-olds live in the community. We forget that. More, you know, about 60% of them. So uh, people are active, stay active and healthy well into their 90s and 100s now. <coughs> Cheryl just makes a really interesting point with her question. How do we shift our discussion out of the healthcare system and have the conversation about what it really is, which is um, life, living when you're old um, and, and, and living in a visible way? Yeah, I think it is a really important thing that we, that's the other thing we do is we pathologize aging too much. You know, aging is not an illness. It's actually, I, I talk about it in the book, it's a gift. Like the fact that people live into their 90s and 100s is a miracle of science and of society and of our social programs. And we should be celebrating this. We shouldn't be catastrophizing it. So again, it's about, about think how we think about these things. And we have to recognize it's not all about care. It's, all about, it's also about housing. It's actually about food. It's an intersection of many, many things. Uh, it's about, you know, who... Uh, helps the elderly. I, I say in the book that COVID is the intersection of, of racism and sexism and ageism. 
because COVID was about older people being cared for by racialized women and each of those subsequent groups was more uh, disrespected than the last. So it, it was a really, a, it was a, a pandemic of, of the marginalized and it was really just illustrated by, by the catastrophe in, in elder care. Adrian writes, uh, what we're learning about food and health, including immune support and depression, can you comment on why residents in care are not included in the recommendation by the Health Canada, by Health Canada regarding the improved food plan and audits based on less healthy and pleasant food and unpleasant food? It's a big well, question. Uh, yeah, good question. I'll tell you the simple answer is the food budgets are $9 a day. So you can't provide very much good food for $9 a day, to be honest. It's uh, slightly more than prisoners are allocated, but uh, very marginally more. So it, these, again, are just fundamental budgeting choices that uh, we have to say, you know, food matters. Uh, this is your home. We're going to treat you, give you decent meals, et cetera. And again, that's what the homes that are person-centered, these things really matter. Rhonda writes, Andre, you are inspiring me to make a career change, to be retrained as a PSW or healthcare aide. Our seniors deserve so much more. I might be only one person, but if others see this call to duty, maybe we can make a tangible difference, especially if we understand the bigger picture you're presenting. Well, that's great to hear as someone with my color hair. I, <laughs> I certainly want to want and need more personal support workers. I, I, you know, I'm great to hear that, but I think we have to recognize, you know, it's a hard job. Uh, so I hope you're committed. I hope you really want to do this. But people who do this job generally do it really superbly. I, I noticed someone in the chat said something that I should have said that uh, personal support workers make such a difference in people's lives. They're literally their hands and their ears and their feet to, at different par parts of the day. And, and they just make people's life worth living. And uh, we have to really recognize their, their value. Yeah. Rhonda, if you do decide to make this change, shoot us a note at the journalism school. We'd love to follow your story and, uh, and see what, what comes of this. Um, because it is really going to take individual actions to, to make this change. Thanks for sharing that with us. Um, Roxanne is saying, if the majority of people state that they wish to remain at home, have we in the province of Ontario, for example, listened to or learned anything, uh, considering home and community care groups um, feeling left out of the provincial budget, which appears to be focused on hospitals and LTC? How can for impact, instead of saying not for profit, home care groups compete and retain staff to enable safe and quality patient care? Another big question. Yeah, very big question. To start with the beginning, again, I say in the book, you know, it's a perversity, the fact that if you ask people where they want to live, nobody wants to live in long-term care, right? There's been polls done in recent weeks with 95% no in one poll. One of them said, I grew, you know, about 50% of people said I'd rather be dead than be in a long-term care home, which is a bit extreme. Some people do need institutional care, but it, it, it's just this perversity of policy that we tell people you have to have something you don't want. Uh, and it's more expensive and it's more inefficient and it's it's all these things that it sh we shouldn't value it, but we push people there. So it's really weird to me. I, I never understood why we pushed people to this most costly and inefficient form of care when people, especially when people want something else. So again, it's about our values. It's about shifting. Why does it happen politically? I think it's an interesting question. I think part of it is... Uh, I often say you, you can't cut a ribbon on everybody's house, right? But you can cut a fancy ribbon on a big new facility or a hospital, or you can announce, as Doug Ford loves to do every few weeks, announce, I'm going to build beds. And I, my biggest fear coming out of this is we're just going to build more long-term care beds. Because I, again, you know, I don't think we need more mediocre care that people don't want. We need a shift, a fundamental shift in how and where care is delivered. So again, it's just about each of us individually, collectively saying, no, we're, we don't want that approach anymore. Uh, they're building a home in suburban Toronto that has 600 beds. That's the exact opposite of what we need. We need to build, be building uh, 20 and 30 bed facilities that look like houses uh, as they do again. You know, in, I remember walking down the street in Copenhagen, uh, family home, family home, nursing home, family home, couldn't tell the difference. I was trying to find the home I, you know, I didn't look any different. I had trouble finding it. That's how it should be. It should be part of the community. Uh, we should build homes like they do in 
the Netherlands attached daycare facilities to schools so that older people are seen every day by young people. You know, we make our older people invisible. No wonder we have these stereotypes about them. We only see them on the news where they're all rickety and dying. That's, that's not the reality. We have to make them central members of the community. Shiraz is uh, where we'll end uh, this evening. Thank you all for your uh, wonderful questions and comments. Shiraz writes and, and um, identifies uh, uh, self as educator and gerontologist. In terms of challenging ageism, I've created Grandparents Film Festival to increase visibility of elders and grandparents and grandchildren friendship in the movie industry. What are your comments on ageism in Canada? There are 8 million grandparents in this country. How many movies are there with elders in them in Canada? It's a good point. Yeah, it's a good question. Sounds like a good, uh, good film festival. If my uh... I, I'm really keen to be a grandfather myself. My kids aren't cooperating yet, but uh, I'm looking forward to being part of that demographic, uh, like I think many people. And uh, I, I can't tell you how many films there are, but uh, probably not enough. I think there are not enough good representations of, of real life of, of elders in Canada. Again, vast majority are pretty healthy, uh, pretty active, et cetera. And we have, to, we have to recognize that while at the same time taking care of those who, who do need help. And that to me, I'll, you know, I'll finish on that. I think that's what Medicare is about, right? It's not about how much money we're spending. It's like an insurance program. Uh, every one of these 80 and 90 year olds has paid in their taxes for 40 or 50 years and it's time to collect. And that's, we should be paying them back. This is part of the, the social contract to be cared for when you can no longer care for yourself and you have to honor that contract and stop disrespecting and stop neglecting people on a grand scale. I promised that we would uh, touch on um, chapter 12 and we did that throughout the questions. Um, you write about staffing, caregivers, long-term care homes themselves, uh, the whole question of home care and funding. And you sort of wind up with some comments about community. Can I get you to read the last paragraph of the book and the final line as we wind down this evening's event? Yeah, so I'll try and do it quickly. I'm not as good a reader as you. You should have been my audiobook uh, reader, but uh, I'll try and do it quickly. So I say right at the end of the book, uh, spoiler alert for those who don't haven't read to the end yet, one of the great privileges of being a journalist is being allowed into people's lives, often when they're under extreme duress. Some of the caregivers and workers I interviewed were stressed and sleepless, having been locked out of care homes because of the pandemic or fearing for their lives. Others were grieving a parent or spouse who had just died. Yet they shared intimacies, emotions, and insights in the hope that it would help spark reform and ensure others will not be neglected and suffer as they and their loved ones have. That dedication and strength is awe-inspiring. I can only hope that I've done their stories justice. And most of all, my fervent wish is that those with the power to make the necessary changes to elder care are listening and at long last willing to act. A perfect place to end. The book is called Neglected No More, The Urgent Need to Improve the Lives of Canada's Elders in the Wake of a Pandemic. Um, Andre, you, you really are an inspiration. The, the high bar, the North Star, as the students are starting to call Andre when he dutifully comes to class every week and participates in a graduate journalism program. Um, I thank you so much for tonight. And um, you're getting a lot of love in the chat from the people who have been participating with us this evening. So I thank them as well well. And I'm going to hand things back to Jorge. Andre, thank you so much. Ron, thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Jorge, for the invitation and Candy for doing the hard work in the background. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much, Catherine and Andre. This is wonderful. Uh, thank you for masterfully taking on this diversity and breadth of, of, of issues and topics and really giving us uh, an incredible sense of where this topic is and also addressing so many of the questions. So I think uh, probably like the audience, I feel very included in this conversation because you really touched on what everyone was thinking. Um, so I'm going to ask you both to leave now the stage. I'm going to do a wrap up event. So thank you again for being thank part you. of this. Good night, everyone. Thank you. All right. So um, thank you again for all of you uh, who joined. If you like this event, uh, I really encourage you to check out the events on our Facebook page and subscribe to our email newsletter. Uh, these are easiest ways to 